So this is the case of a 47 year old woman who has presented with headache and uh, these are the this is the axial T2 and uh, T1 weighted MRI sequences and they show that there is a very subtle uh, cystic lesion in the atria of the right lateral ventricle and uh, this lesion is iso intense to CSF on T2 and it is iso to uh, slightly hyper intense on T1. These are the uh, flare and DWI images and they show uh, the increased signal uh, within this lesion. So this is the uh, lesion <coughs> which is located, uh, subtle cystic lesion which is located in the atria of the right lateral ventricle. So considering this uh, key imaging finding of a cystic lesion in the ventricle, that is ventricular cyst, so the top differential should be um, choroid plexus cyst. However, uh, you can add ependymal cyst in the differential along with arachnoid cyst and uh, choroid plexus xanthogranuloma. So this is a case of choroid plexus xanthogranuloma. However, uh, you can add choroid plexus cyst, ependymal cyst and uh, arachnoid cyst in the differentials. So this is uh, an adolescent girl uh, who is presented with episodic headaches. Uh, this is the axial CT scan and uh, it shows a round hyperdense lesion along the anterior uh, superior third ventricle uh, between and uh, posterior to the fornices and the foramina of Monroe. And this lesion is better depicted and uh, it is hyper intense on uh, flare sequence and also on uh, T2 weighted MRI it is hyper intense. Uh, compared to the brain parenchyma, uh, it is hyper intense. On sagittal T1 weighted MRI as well, uh, the, this mass is hyper intense uh, compared to the brain parenchyma, and uh, the columns of the uh, fornix are seen along the superior and anterior aspect of the mass. So, considering this typical imaging finding of uh, a hyper dense or hyper intense uh, circumscribed mass along the anterior superior third ventricle, uh, the only differential that should be formed is colloid cyst. So this is a case of colloid cyst. So next we have a 23 year old woman who is presented with the headaches and uh, this is the axial T1 weighted MRI and axial T2 weighted MRI and it shows a left uh, cerebellopontine angle mass which is ISO to uh, slightly hyper intense uh, to CSF signal. Okay, it is ISO to slightly hyper intense uh, CSF signal to the CSF signal. And uh, also on the flare and DWI sequences, we can see that uh, this lesion is showing increased signal intensity. On the flare sequence as well, it is hyper intense. On DWI as well, it is hyper intense. Um, the Post contrast uh, sequence showed no enhancement, which is not shown here. However, uh, the post contrast sequence showed no enhancement. So, this is uh, uh, extra axial mass uh, with signal characteristics uh, which are very similar to the CSF and it is uh, giving increased signal on DWI. So, that means that uh, this uh, lesion is giving diffusion restriction. So diffusion restriction, uh, the lesion which is giving diffusion restriction in this typical location of cerebellopontine angle uh, should always be considered as epidermoid. So this is an epidermoid cyst. So this is uh, a young adult woman who has presented with acute uh, onset of headache, nausea and visual disturbance. So on the sagittal T1 and T2 weighted MRI, uh, we can see that on initial presentation, uh, there is an enlarged uh, pituitary gland with the homogeneously increased uh, T1 signal and decreased uh, T2 signal intensity, uh, which is uh, consistent with blood products. However, on follow-up examination, uh, we can see that uh, the pituitary gland has uh, significantly decreased in size uh, with residual increased T1 and decreased T2 uh, signal intensity so which is consistent with resolving hemorrhage. So there was hemorrhage initially which is resolved now uh, because of the decreased size of the pituitary gland okay and now uh, 
there is residual increase T1 and decrease T2 signal intensity. So, considering this imaging finding of hemorrhage within an enlarged pituitary gland, uh, the only diagnosis is of pituitary apoplexy. So, this is a case of a pituitary apoplexy which is basically a clinical syndrome uh, caused by pituitary infarction or hemorrhage uh, typically within an underlying lesion. So, there is always an underlying lesion uh, which undergoes hemorrhage uh, causing pituitary apoplexy. So, this is a case of an 8 year old girl who has presented with chronic headaches and uh, as you can see that this is the sagittal T1 weighted MRI and it reveals the um, uh, it reveals a curvy linear, uh, there is a curvy linear hyper intensity along the outer margin of the uh, splenium and the posterior body of the uh, corpus callosum and the corpus callosum appears normally formed. So, the corpus callosum is normally formed, however, there is a curvy linear hyper intensity along the outer margin of the splenium and the posterior body of the corpus callosum. So, this is the midline fat signal intensity along the margin of the corpus callosum. So, obviously, the only differential should be uh, lipoma and that is also pericallosal lipoma. So, this is a case of pericallosal lipoma. So, this is a young girl who has presented with chronic ataxia and uh, gastrointestinal lesions as well. So, on the axial T2 weighted MRI, uh, there is thickening of the left cerebellar cortex. Uh, with regions of increased uh, signal intensity within the underlying white matter uh, which is resulting in a striated or corduroy appearance. On the coronal uh, post contrast scan we can see that there is a similar striated appearance of the left cerebellar hemisphere which is secondary to the decreased parenchymal signal intensity and enhancement of the overlying uh, leptomeningeal uh, venous structures. So, this is uh, the, the key finding here is of a cerebellar mass with a striated or corduroy appearance. So, this is a typical imaging finding in the case of Lermite Duclos disease. So, this is a case of Lermite Duclos disease which is basically a dysplastic cerebellar gangliocytoma of uh, uncertain etiology. So, this is another patient presenting with persistent headaches after upper respiratory infection. These are the images uh, on the axial enhanced uh, CT scan. You can see that there is a, a rim enhancing epidural fluid collection uh, with air fluid level which is overlying the right frontal lobe. On the follow up uh, axial T2 scan, there is uh, the epidural collection uh, which is hyper intense and whereas its rim and uh, the underlying dura are hypo intense. So, on the T2 scan as well, this epidural collection is noticed. However, it is uh, the collection itself is hyper intense. However, its rim and the underlying dura are hyper intense. Also, there is prominent vasogenic edema with associated mass effect on the underlying brain parenchyma. The rim enhancement of this collection, the rim enhancement of this collection and underlying dural enhancement is also noted on the uh, axial T1 uh, post contrast scan and uh, the frontal sinus disease is also noted here. So, uh, this is a case of a rim enhancing epidural uh, fluid collection which is also showing dural enhancement. So, this is a case of epidural abscess. So, this is a case of a young patient who has uh, presented after a motor vehicle accident, after a motor vehicle accident. So, this is the axial CT scan and it shows a lenticular uh, biconvex hyperdense extra axial hemorrhage with mass effect on the underlying right frontal lobe as well as the uh, superficial uh, scalp hematoma is also noted with soft tissue swelling. This hemorrhage is confined uh, by the coronal suture and uh, this is the cone down that is the zoomed in axial CT scan image in bone window and it reveals a non-displaced uh, fracture of the frontal bone which is just uh, anterior to the uh, coronal suture with mild sutural diastasis and uh, overlying scalp uh, skin laceration is also noted with the soft tissue swelling. 
So, this is a case of uh, epidural hematoma that is quite evident this is the case of epidural hematoma and uh, this is the only diagnosis here. So, this is uh, patient A and uh, it is a post trauma patient also there are few other images here and uh, this patient C is a child with headaches and vomiting. So, let us uh, go through the images of patient A. So, on the axial and uh, reformatted coronal CT images, uh, you can see that there is a mixed attenuation uh, subdural hemorrhage which is overlying the right cerebral hemisphere uh, with midline shift to the left and subfalcine herniation. The also, there is compression of the right lateral ventricle and partial entrapment of the left lateral ventricle. The left lateral ventricle is partially entrapped. Um, the axial CT scan in patient B here in patient B reveals uh, the intra parenchymal subarachnoid hemorrhage also the subdural hemorrhage within the uh, within and overlying the left temporal lobe uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage uh, within the interpeduncular fossa and uh, overlying the right frontal lobe. So, this is the location of the subdural hemorrhage in the patient B. Sorry, okay, and uh, subdural hemorrhage along the fox and uh, interhemispheric fissure, uh, pneumocephalus and um, diffuse cerebral edema and bilateral uncle herniation with the cisternal effacement and compression of the midbrain is also noted. Now, in the sagittal T1 weighted MRI sequence in the patient C who is a child, there is a midline uh, posterior fossa mass which is causing mass effect on the brain stem and inferior displacement of the cerebellar tonsils. Uh, through the foramen magnum and also causing the obstructive hydrocephalus. So, this is uh, these are case of intracranial mass effect with associated herniations that is brain herniations are shown here subfalcine herniation, transmitorial herniation. So, these are uncle herniations so all these herniations are shown here. Next is case of an adolescent boy. Uh, with high grade glioma, he was referred for pre operative planning. So, this is the axial uh, T2 weighted MRI, and it shows a mixed cystic and solid mass which is centered within the right thalamus, uh, deep white matter, and the medial lentiform nuclei with surrounding visogenic edema. There is mass effect on the right uh, lateral and third ventricles, uh, causing midline shift to the left and entrapment of the bilateral atria and occipital horns of the lateral ventricles. The T1 post contrast uh, sequence with fat suppression shows the solid and ring enhancement within this lesion. These are the axial color coded DTI image, images and uh, it shows the infiltration and displacement of various uh, deep white matter uh, tracts, the sequen sequential reformatted uh, three dimensional uh, functional images show the mass with respect to the motor tracts for uh, pre operative planning. So, this is a case of high grade tumor which is centered in the deep gray and white matter with diffusion tensile imaging and functional imaging. Uh, so, the diagnosis here is uh, that uh, there is a pre operative tractography done here and tractography is basically functional mapping of the tracts and fibers and interconnections within the brain and uh, this is shown here that is preoperative tractography is shown here. So, uh, a young adult woman, uh, adult woman presenting with cognitive impairment and ataxia these are the images as you can see that on the axial flare uh, sequence uh, shows the enlargement of the lateral uh, ventricles, the third ventricle and the fourth ventricles with the hyperdynamic CSF flow signal intensity. 
The sagittal uh, T2 weighted MRI reveals ventricular megaly with the CSF flow voids uh, within the third and uh, fourth ventricles as well as through the cerebral aqueduct and uh, the fourth ventricular outlet uh, foramina. A ventricular drainage catheter is also partially visualized uh, within the lateral ventricle. So, this is a case of ventricular megaly in an adult patient and uh, obviously the diagnosis, top diagnosis should be normal pressure hydrocephalus. However, you can put central atrophy in it, hydrocephalus, normal pressure hydrocephalus and dementia complex like Alzheimer's disease or uh, frontotemporal dementia or multi infarct dementia, they can all be included in the differentials. So, this is a young girl who is uh, presenting with headache, altered mental status and neck or back pain. So, this is the axial T1 uh, pre-contrast and post-contrast uh, images and they show that there is nodular uh, leptomeningeal enhancement. Okay, so there is uh, nodular uh, leptomeningeal enhancement uh, which is involving the uh, left more than the right frontal and uh, left temporal lobes. Also there is a small left temporal subdural collection uh, hypointensity which is adjacent to the frontal horns of the lateral ventricles corresponds to the regions of gliosis. Okay, it is corresponding to the regions of gliosis. So basically there is nodular leptomeningeal enhancement involving the left frontal and left temporal lobes. So this is a case of uh, leptomeningeal enhancement and uh, you can uh, obviously and the top diagnosis will be meningitis and other than that you can add uh, neurosarcoidosis in the differential or leptomeningeal carcinomatosis and collateral vascular flow and uh, subacute infarction. So this is a young patient who has presented with headaches and uh, this is the coronal T1 post contrast MRI and it reveals the abnormal diffuse dural thickening and enhancement and also there is enlargement of the fourth ventricle which is very partially seen here but however the main imaging finding here is abnormal diffuse dural thickening and enhancement. So, uh, the pachymeningeal or dural enhancement is the key finding here and uh, obviously the diag diagnosis would be pachymeningeal carcinomatosis and also you can put intracranial hypotension in the differential and metastasis as well. So, this is a case of 42 year old immunocompromised man presenting with headache, nausea and vomiting. So, uh, these are the um, axial flare MRI sequence and it shows the hyper intense signal uh, which is layering in the dependent portions of the occipital horns of the lateral ventricles along the ependymal uh, surfaces bilaterally and within the bilateral uh, deep grey and uh, white matter. On the post contrast sequence. Uh, on the axial post contrast sequence we can uh, see that there is symmetric and uh, abnormal ependymal enhancement posteriorly. Also there is a disproportionate parenchymal volume loss for the age of the patient. So these findings uh, that is the layering intraventricular debris along with the enhancing ependymal the, uh, the ependymal enhancement. So, this is uh, quite uh, characteristic for ventriculitis or ependymitis. So, the top differential should always in this case should be ventriculitis or ependymitis. Other than that, you can add carcinomatosis and uh, hemorrhage in the differentials, intraventricular hemorrhage and carcinomatosis. So, this is a 8 months old boy who is presented uh, with enlarged head circumference. So, this is the axial CT scan and it shows the symmetric uh, extra axial CSF attenuation fluid collections which are overlying the frontal lobes. The reformatted uh, coronal CT image reveals the bifrontal extra axial collection with vessels which are uh, traversing through the fluid 
which is indicating the enlargement of the subarachnoid space uh, rather than the subdural collections. So, this is uh, a basically the key imaging finding here is the enlarged extra axial CSF spaces in an infant. So, this is uh, the diagnosis here is of benign macrocrania and in the differentials uh, you can add communicating hydrocephalus, parenchymal injury or atrophy and subdural collections. However, in this case this is the diagnosis or this is a case of benign macrocrania which is a self-limiting condition in infants with normal neurological development. So this is uh, a young girl who has presented with pituitary insufficiency and uh, these are the images. Now as you can see on the axial and coronal detuvated MRI there is uh, absence of the septum pellucidum with the characteristic flattening of the roof of the frontal horns of the lateral ventricles on the coronal image. Now on these uh, coned down or uh, zoomed in uh, images uh, T2 weighted MRI sequences we can see that there is uh, uh, bilateral optic nerve hypoplasia as well. So there is bilateral optic nerve hypoplasia along with the absence of the septum pellucidum. So this is a typical case of uh, septo-optic dysplasia. These are typical imaging findings that is absence of septum pellucidum along with hypoplastic optic nerves are uh, typical findings in seen in septo-optic dysplasia and uh, you can also add holoprosencephaly and septal injury in the differentials. So this is an uh, early adolescent girl who has presented with developmental and motor delay. So as you can see that this is the axial T2 and flare MRI sequences and it shows multiple bilateral uh, enlarged uh, perivascular spaces in the periatrial uh, white matter. Also there is surrounding increased uh, flare signal intensity as well as there are additional foci of uh, subcortical flare signal abnormality involving the cerebral hemispheres. So, this is uh, uh, a case of enlarged perivascular spaces and um, the diagnosis here is of mucopolysaccharidosis that is Hurler syndrome and uh, in the differentials you can add Virco-Robin spaces, ischemia and infection. Also neuroepithelial cysts can be added. So this is the case of a young girl who has presented with headaches and transient diplopia on the axial uh, and uh, these are the axial and coronal post contrast uh, sequences. Uh, we can see uh, that uh, on the fat suppressed sequence there is uh, focal enlargement and enhancement uh, which is involving the cisternal segment of the right oculomotor nerve. Okay, so there is focal enlargement and enhancement of the cisternal segment of the right oculomotor nerve. So oculomotor nerve enhancement uh, is seen in ophthalmoplegic migraine. Also you can add schwannoma in the differentials along with meningitis, leptomeningeal carcinomatosis, neurosarcoidosis and ophthalmoplegic migraine is the diagnosis here.